Um, so, as I said, thank you, by the way, for both Richard and Sue. Thank you ever so much for that. Um, the opening session here, how serious is the climate crisis and how could it affect us, a briefing for trade unionists. Um, this, se this section is going to be given by Professor Kevin Anderson, who's Deputy Director of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. Um, Kevin will speak for quite, quite a reasonably long period of time in order, uh, and that's necessary obviously for us to do what we had hoped to do, to give that sort of thorough understanding about what is happening. Um, there will be some time at the end for questions, so if you do have a specific question, keep that in, in mind and we'll send the, the mic out to take those at the end. But meanwhile, Kevin, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, right, I've got about, we hold about 45 minutes-ish, there or thereabouts. Um, this won't be a very uplifting talk and it won't have many pictures, in fact, that's it. No, no polar bears or emperor penguins or droughts or anything like that. It's, there's, there's words and there's a few graphs and there's some numbers. Um, but I'll try and make it at least you know, moderately interesting. Um, what I'm going to try and do is it'd be a whistle stop tour really from the science um, of climate change but with a principal focus on issues of emissions. Because actually it's, it's the emissions that really matter. Um, you know, the science is all pretty much just in my day would be just O-level physics but the science is, is, is relatively straightforward but it's then understanding what's happening in terms of emissions I'm going to try to bring that towards the end to some suggestions about how we can get off um, the, the uh, sort of fossil fuel train that we're on at the moment and try to bring emissions down and try to lead into some, some pointers um, for this particular event today in terms of jobs and the economy. Um, I've called the talk here real close for the Emperor and I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it so I'll, I'll have to read quite a lot of it out I think because I think at the back probably it's probably just a little postage stamp for you. Um, I've called it real close for the Emperor which hopefully you all know that story in my, in my view, the mitigation emperor, uh, despite having the Committee on Climate Change, despite a lot of good work that has been done in the UK and elsewhere, but as far as I'm concerned, they are completely naked. And they've been running past this for the last 20 years since the Earth Summit in 1992, for those of you with grey hair or no hair that can remember that particular event. Um, that, you know, the, the, the emperor has had no clothes since 1992, but we keep pretending that they're fully dressed, and we continue to do that with you know, dressed in emissions trading scheme or carbon tax or some other spurious measure that we, we always talk about. So that's, that's the sort of base, the framing of the talk, and we're going to face the, the challenges of climate change. Um, the global context. I'm going to start off here with um, a quote from the International Energy Agency. These are not a left-wing think tank. They are traditionally been, they have traditionally been the sort of, in some respects, they're the, they're the organ of the established energy industry, which is, is principally fossil fuel based. So they have in some ways been the mouthpiece of the fossil fuel industry. So it's interesting that they're saying these sort of things, and they're saying them regularly. They're not saying them once or twice. They're saying this sort of thing, they put it in their documents repeatedly. Now, admittedly, you can look at other documents they produce that would seem to counter this, but this is their over, over, overriding message here. This is from their chief economist, Fatih Birol, but you find the same sorts of comments from their CEO as well. When I look at the CO2 trend data, um, it is perfectly in line with a temperature increase of 6 degrees Celsius, 6 degrees Celsius, and it's talking about during the century by about 2100. <coughs> um, and this would have devastating consequences for the planet. Now, whether it's six or whether it's five or whether it's seven or four, I mean, what he's saying is that we are moving towards a world that we cannot comprehend at all. And it's worth pointing, bearing in mind that five to six degrees C temperature rise or temperature difference is what you see during the ice age and now. So these are temperature changes of that sort of order of magnitude that we're heading towards. The new head of the World Bank, um, again, not also known for being a radical organization, um, Jim Yong Kim, said that at four degrees C, he would anticipate seeing food and water fights everywhere. And you can see, you think, well, that might be exaggerating, but look what happened in Darfur when the pasture lands changed a little bit there. People didn't reach for the, for the debating table to negotiate their limited resources. They reached for the Kalashnikov and fought and killed each other. So uh, this, this is not an unreasonable sort of comment to make, that as the resources become more and more constrained, and as climate change feeds into other, other, um, other uh, stresses anyway, that we are likely to see those sorts of outcomes. So we, it's incumbent on us, I think, to try to avoid these. So what of the UK? What have we... What we signed up to. Now, hopefully, some of you will be familiar with this the Copenhagen Accord 2009 2010, the Cancun Agreement, and all the other great um, international negotiations that we continue to sign up to. Indeed, the Camp David Declaration last year, where David Cameron signed up with the G8, um, and also the UK's Low Carbon Transition Plan. They all say something along these lines. This, this quote is actually taken from the, from the Accord. UK is committed to make its fair contribution to hold the increase in global temperature 
below 2 degrees Celsius. Notice that, below. It doesn't say a 50-50 chance of, or there, or thereabouts. It says below 2 degrees Celsius. And to take action to meet this um, objective. Now, these are two quite radical statements. Firstly, consistent with science. The policymakers are saying they want to be consistent with science. Let's hold them to it. And on the basis of equity. Now, that, again, both of those things we repeatedly sign up to. So let's hold our, our paymasters um, to what they, are, what they, say, what they state. Um, every year they sign up to this. They'll be doing the same thing in Warsaw this year. So what we have there, we have the, the, um, the emission trends heading towards <coughs> 4, 5, 6 degrees C. But actually the rhetoric is much more around 2 degrees C. And I just want to put that in some sort of perspective now. Looking at this, this is, I think, might be the only graph. There might be one more graph. For those of you who can't see it, and then see the numbers, it's the shape that matters, mostly. Um, sure. Right, the side, this, this axis here, the, up, the um, Y axis, the up axis, that's in billion tons of carbon dioxide, gigatons of carbon dioxide, so it's lots of CO2, basically. And the axis along the bottom uh, is a date from 1980 out to 2050. So for, you know, the lives of quite a lot of us, I think, probably. And what I want to point out is what's been happening to emissions. Um, in, in 1980, um, the emissions were about 20 billion tonnes, 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide that were pumping into the atmosphere from fossil fuel combustion primarily. Um, and in 1988, which was being recognised already as a problem, the United Nations um, set up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was initially chaired by John Houghton. Um, so the first chair of that organisation was a British chair. Um, so that, that organisation is obviously still going now and, and produces scientific reports every few years. In 1992, there was the Rio Earth Summit. Notice the emissions. The Rio Earth Summit was about 20 billion tonnes. That's at the time of the Rio Earth Summit. But there or thereabouts. And hopefully quite a lot of you remember that. And people were quite up, um, upbeat and optimistic about issues of sustainability, Agenda 21, and climate change and biodiversity, and all these other things that came out of that really quite, quite um, positive meeting. But by 2000, here you've got the Royal Commission report on environmental pollution, from, uh, environmental pollution talking about climate change. Um, and they, they came up initially then, there was a slight misreading of it, but the government started to adopt this target of a 60% reduction in emissions in the UK by 2050. David King, 2004, climate change is the most dangerous threat we face, more so than international terrorism. Um, Copenhagen in 2009 10, and then uh, the Rio Plus 20. Now, people, people hopefully most of you remember or have heard about Rio Plus 20, it was on, on last year, most people thought of it as Rio Plus 20 years. I see it as Rio plus 20 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. Because actually, whilst we've been flying around the world to all sorts of exciting jamborees on climate change, the emissions have doubled. So that is our success so far, to recognise a problem and to make it twice as bad as it was when we first recognised it. That's what we've managed to achieve in 20 years. And that's probably the good news. <laughs> Um, we're now going through, it's unfair to say it's a global economic downturn, it's probably an economic downturn in the West, significantly, in the OECD countries, um, but even some stagnation in countries like India and so forth, and a slight slowing down of the economy in other parts of the world. But at the same time, emissions have been going up at phenomenally fast rates, despite the fact we're seeing a, um, a slight dampening in the world economy. Um, in, in globally, in 2010, they went up by 6%. Now, I think that's a higher increase in one year than, than occurred during the Industrial Revolution. And remember, it occurred from a very large number. So we're already at a very high level, and the growth rate is enormous, and it is not going down. It's at 3 4%, and that's sort of rate. That's the rate of increase in CO2 emissions from a very large number, year on, year out, year in, year off. So what's going to happen to this in the future? We know quite a lot about the next few years. We're unlikely to see some ra radical change in the next two or three years, and we start to plot what this might look like. But it's worth bearing in mind that what we're doing now is locking in the future to certain ways of, of doing things. So the energy system, if you think about the design lines for those things, if you build a power station, a nuclear power station or a wind turbine or a gas-fired power station, whatever you want to build, they're going to be there for 25 to 50 years. So when we build something today, it is going to be there providing electricity for the next three, four, five decades. When you build a building, or put in a sewage network, or put in a transmission network, they're going to be there probably for 50, 100, maybe even longer. I don't know what's happened to this building when it's got rid of, or I'm not sure when it was built, but I mean, it was built some time ago. I guess it was in the 60s, looking at it, in here. Um, and it, it, whether it's been knocked down or keep going, I don't know. But the building I'm in was built in the 60s as well. Most of the buildings that we're going to live in in 2050 are already built, and many of them were built in 1930. So we, we are locking ourselves into the infrastructure when we build something new. So we have to bear that in mind every time we do it. And if you think of aviation and ships, and some, both areas I've worked on, they traditionally last about 30 years once you've <coughs> them and they're flying. 
747 was designed in 1964, first sold in 1969, and people still fire it today. Okay, it's tweaked a little bit, but it's still, it's still basically a, um, a Whittle jet engine from 1936, I think it was. So they're still the same plane. So the A380 Airbus, if it follows the same path, would be gracing our skies, if you call it that, in 2017, 2018. So they're the sorts of time frames that we're locking in. That's why it's really important to make the changes today, because if we don't make it today, we can't make it tomorrow, because tomorrow is too late. So let's imagine that we can do as much as we say we're going to do at the moment. We're not doing these things. Remember, this, this is a global picture. Um, and let's see where that would take us. The emission curve will look something like this. This is not a do-nothing scenario. This is do-quite-a-lot scenario. The emissions are going in that sort of direction at the moment. And if you then say, well, actually, climate change, I'll come back to this later, is all about the area under the curve. In other words, the emissions. The emissions are the bit under the curve. So if you look at the emission of the area under that curve and say, well, how much is there? For those of you who have to enter the numbers, it's about 3,000 uh, billion tonnes uh, between 20, 2000 and 2050. And you can relate the amount of emissions you pump into the atmosphere to the temperature. It's not perfect, like a lot of science, there's a lot of uncertainties, and in climate science there's more uncertainties than many other areas, because it's very complex. But you broadly get a feel from this that suggests that we are heading towards a 4 to 6 degrees, 4 to 6 degrees C temperature rise during this century. And again, if you come from, I live in the Peak District, just below Kinder, where the mass trespasses started, 4 to 6 degrees sounds quite pleasant to me. Um, so, you know, we have to think, well, how does that play out, actually, regionally? How, you know, how come that, what well, doesn't sound like too bad a number, actually, you know, what are the impacts of that? Because they are pretty devastating. So I'll come back into that later. But that's what we signed up to. I don't know if you can see that, the difference between the two. That's the rhetoric, sorry, that's the rhetoric, the two degrees C. And that's what we're doing. Look at the gap between them. The gap is enormous. So the, the question that I think needs to be asked is, is how do you transition from the rhetoric to what we say we want to try and do. And let's not pretend 2 degrees C, I'm not going to go into that today, but let's not pretend that 2 degrees C rise is particularly good. Many people around the planet will die at 2 degrees C. They'll be poor, and they'll be a long way from here, by and large, a few might be in this country as well, and some people may benefit in this country from 2 degrees C temporarily. And certainly parts of northern parts of Russia they will do. But 2 degrees C will kill many people around the planet. So we're not talking already, even if we hold to that, we're not talking about uh, an equitable division. Because the people they will kill, by and large, are people who have hardly emitted anything. This is from the Committee on Climate Change. I'm quite critical of government and the committee um, on and off during this talk. But I should say that I have a lot of time for the fact that the UK put in place the 2008 Climate Change Act and actually also set up the Committee on Climate Change. We have a lot of time for the people there. They're doing a very good job. They claim to be independent, or they said to be independent. They're not really. They still have to play to a political message. Um, and over a pint, they sort of admit this. Um, you know, this is from their report in 2009 and 2011. To keep global average temperature rise close to 2 degrees centigrade, the UK must cut emissions by at least 80%. And I'll come back to that later as to why that doesn't make much sense. And the other bit, of course, if you want to get anything published um, in this world, uh, you have to then add this section. The good news is that, this, that, is that reductions of that size can be, um, are possible without sacrificing the benefits of economic growth and rising prosperity. Because that, of course, is the... Yeah, we, can all, we can all be swimming to work as long as we've got economic growth and rising <laughs> prosperity. Um, and, and I will come back to that later because I think that's not viable. Um, well, I'll come back to a couple of slides. There's an alternative take on that. This is, this is based all on the same science, and I'll come back to that again as we go through. Um, if we think it's appropriate, when we think about it, you know, climate change is a global problem. We've got a global budget of carbon dioxide to use. And if we think it's therefore appropriate for the poorer parts of the world to have actually some emission space so they can improve their welfare, they can increase their energy consumption in the poorer parts of the world. And my guess is with an audience like this, you're all going to take that on board. I mean, probably you all take it on board, you know, um, honestly. As a, all audiences will say, yes, we agree with that, but then many of them don't really but talk quietly. But, you know, so we all think the poor people should have a larger part of the budget than us, those of us that already caused the problem. And if that's the case, you then have to ask the question, well, what's left for us? And our conclusion, if you look at the same science, is that it's difficult to envisage anything other than a planned economic recession. Now, I know that may be possibly in this audience, of, uh, or in many of the audiences to do with, with, with the unions, as well as it is with the politicians. Um, that's not a popular term. Now, you can, you can try and make it, put it a contraction, call it whatever you want it to be, find some other nice words for it. But it's the same, we all know it's the same thing. And um, so, a planned economic recession being compatible with um, stabilization at or below four, 650 parts per minute. For those that that's about 4 degrees C. So even for a 4 degrees C future, there isn't enough emission space for us to keep on growing our economy, to leave a little bit of emission space for the poorer parts of the world. And I'll come back to how, how we're playing with those numbers deliberately in our policies in the UK at the moment. 
where we actually basically say that the poor people should have no more emissions. Now, it is worth pointing, bear in mind that that's only necessary if we actually put low carbon energy supply in place. If you had a low carbon system, then it wouldn't be a problem. But we're not going to put one in place quite quickly. It will take probably a few decades, even if we tried hard, and we're not trying hard yet. No one's trying hard yet. So, um, you know, until you can do that, until you get the low carbon supply in place, then you have to cut back on how much energy you consume. I'll come back to that um, with this curve here. Remember those curves I showed you? That's the one we've got supposed to aim for. Now, when you think about that, You've got to come off the curve now. You've got to start bringing the emissions down now. You should have started to bring them down 5, 10, 20 years ago. But actually, that's the, the initial part of that is too early for supply. If you like nuclear power stations, how are you going to get by them? I mean, they are low carbon, even if whatever other concerns people may, may or may not have about them. They are low carbon. But how many are going to get built by 2020? One? Two? How many are going to get built by 2030? Five? Six? How many wind turbines are going to get out? A few? Yeah. How much carbon capture and storage? Well, we haven't done one big power, power station around the world on that yet. Nothing at, nothing at the gigawatt scale, anyway. So at the moment, there is nothing that we can do on the supply that will bring us off that curve fast enough. So the only option to start off with is reduced demand. So the only thing that we know that can get us off the curve fast enough is to reduce our demand for energy. And that basically means because we have to reduce it so rapidly, and because we think it's fair that we reduce ours much, much quicker than the poorer people um, around the planet or even in our own country, then that actually means that we have to probably have to cut back on what we consume. Because in the short term, we won't, we, won't, we won't be able to consume as much as we are and come off that curve. Now, that's not to say the supply side, the technologies aren't important. They are really important. And in fact, they're the sort of things that I've traditionally worked on. I come from an engineering background, and I've played with lots of big bits of shiny kit. And they will do a lot of good things with, with you know, engineers. do a lot in this, this sort of time frame. But you're talking about 2025, 2030, before you start to get significant penetration of low-carbon supply technologies. So why is it that there's such, these, these I think are quite, quite radical different, radically different conclusions. You've got the Committee on Climate Change, a respected group of people who really know their stuff, saying, hey, 80% reduction, and we can do that with, with you know, a few tweaks here and there, and rising um, prosperity in the economy and so forth. And you've got us saying, hang on, that doesn't look, look viable at all. We're going to have to cut back on what we consume in the short term. How does that arise? Well, this might look, sound a bit, a bit nerdy, this bit, but it's actually really quite important, because that, like a lot of things, the sort of devil's in the detail. Um, I'm going to go back to the 2 degree C target, and you can, I can write up any statement here at all. This is the Copenhagen Accord, and it says, hold below 2 degrees Celsius. The UK's low carbon transition plan must rise no more than 2 degrees centigrade. Now, all of the statements say something like this. They're never saying a 50-50 chance of. They're always saying you must not exceed. And if you say it's must not, you assume there's a reasonable chance you're going to try not to. Not, not that there's a very high chance you're going to exceed it. So if you think about that, and then um, you translate that language, which is sort of a language of adjectives, if you like, into numbers, because people like me have to have numbers to give us some idea of what the emissions curves will look like, um, the reduction curves. We can, I'm using here the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They have a taxonomy to translate adjectives from policymakers and the rest of us <laughs> into numbers. They're quite handy using this one, because we've signed up to it. And by, by and large, they're saying that um, if you use language like hold below, must rise no more than that. That is at best a 10% chance of exceeding it. No more than that. But the UK government's policies are all premised, and this is their number, not mine, they are, this is all, they are all premised on a 63% chance of exceeding the target. So they're all, that's already an enormous fudge. Now, does that matter? Well, it does, because the carbon budget, the amount of carbon you can emit for a 63% chance of exceeding 2 degrees C, compared to the 10% chance, is twice as much. So you tell me what you, what you want your mitigation policies to be, and I can fudge the numbers to give you an answer for 2 degrees C. And that's basically what's happened here. So we've got a 63% chance. Now, there's two things about this, I think I'll come back to a bit later. The 63% chance does not take account of equity. So that is not, a, when we bring that down to the UK, we're taking a much larger slice of that cake than we should really be taking. So not only are we fudging, this, fudging the probabilities, but we're then fudging um, the fairness issue. And when you put those two together, we end up with these sort of policies that people like the Committee on Climate Change and the government can come up with at the moment. And indeed, many NGOs have fallen into this trap as well. So when you think about this, what I'm saying here is the UK government's um, carbon budget under the Climate Change Act, the 2008 Climate Change Act, the carbon budgets that we have in the UK at the moment, which are almost legislated to be um, or in statute, um, they are twice the size of the carbon budgets that accompany our international commitments that we start sign up to every year. So there's a big difference. We've got two budgets. We've got one that's international, that we keep saying, hey, this is what we're going to be doing, and another one that's national, this is what we've actually legally made 
and binding for the UK. And these are completely different and change the whole policy environment. The implications of this are profound. The UK's current budgets are neither consistent with science or on the basis of equity. Now, that, that, is, a, that is a sort of a radical departure from the conventional view, but all using conventional numbers. It's also worth bearing in mind, you have presumably heard of some of these things, 80% um, reduction by 2050, or a 60% reduction by 2050. This has nothing to do with climate change. And we should never use this language, and nor should any scientists use it, even though they repeatedly use this, this language as shorthand. But shorthand has become accepted science. I would refer to this um, as it's large reductions by not in my term of office. And, and we all like it. We, we, we laugh about it, and we, we, yeah, we think the politics, that's true. We, we think about the politicians, but we like it as well. That allows us to carry on living our lives, you know, going on our holidays, not having to change fundamentally what it is that we do. So everyone, businesses like this, politicians like we all like this. So it means we can really pass the problem on to technology in the future and our children. But the CO2 from keeping these lights on in here, and keep this projector running, will be in the atmosphere for 100, 200 years. Probably 20% of it will be there for up to 10,000 years. So we are changing the climate now for the next hundreds, possibly thousands of years, by holding this event. So that tells us that the build-up of CO2 that matters, not some spurious target for 2050. But that shift from a long-term target, which is meaningless, to actually towards cumulative emissions, i.e. the build-up of CO2 day in, day out. When these lights are on tomorrow, if they're on tomorrow, they will add to the CO2 from today. And that build-up means you have a, you, you're, you're concerned with the cumulative budget, the area under the curve. And that changes the whole chronology, changes the timeline of climate change. From one where we focus on long-term reductions, wind turbines in 2030, or nuclear power, or whatever, carbon capture storage, whatever it might be, biofuel, it takes us from that to saying, actually, when we go home tonight, we've got to not get the tube, we've got to walk, we'll turn the fridge off when we get there, you know, and live a completely, almost in our country, a zero carbon life, and we should have started doing it quite a lot of years ago. So it changes the whole chronology from about the future to about now. And that, that of course, is unpopular with all of us. You know, we don't like that, and hence, by and large, the whole population is, is sort of and 